who doesn't like to talk about sows and cubs? To everyone's delight, they arrive with their spring cubs or their yearlings or even their two and a half year olds. Life is not easy for these sows. They must not only take care of themselves, but their babies as well. It's quite a daunting task when you consider the obstacles they encounter every day. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Kleesrath, one of the rangers here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'm here on the south platform overlooking the Brooks River. We have lots of activity at this end of the river with abundant salmon and lots of hungry bears. We've already had some interesting stories involving moms and cubs so far this year, with 94's arrival with four spring cubs, 39's confrontation with 856, and the loss of a spring cub last week on one of the islands downstream of the falls. Joining me today is Explore.org's resident naturalist, Mike Bitts. Welcome, Mike, and thanks for taking the time to our viewers today. Hey, my pleasure. And it looks like you have a, a great day to be outside um, watching bears and talking about bears. It is beautiful. And uh, so we actually would like to answer a few questions for our, from our audience. If you have them, just drop them in the comments section and a helpful moderator from explore.org will help them send them in our direction. So Mike, uh, you wanna tell us a little bit about what these mothers have to do to prepare to even become moms here at Katmai? Absolutely, there's I think an important first few steps that female bears will experience before you know they give birth, before they uh, bring cubs, of course, back uh, to Brooks River. And we often talk about the importance of fat to brown bears uh, and because they hibernate in winter. And while they're hibernating, bears do not eat or drink. Fat is the fuel that bears utilize to survive winter hibernation. It provides the, the energy to keep them warm in winter and the metabolic water that they need to stay hydrated during that time of year. But for a moment, let's consider the importance of fat to expectant mother bears. We'll discuss the life of a mother bear in the den in just a bit. Long before a bear could give birth though, its body needs to sequester enough body fat to sustain pregnancy and later uh, lactation and nursing. From studies on captive brown bears, we know that the minimum levels of fat reserves necessary to support reproduction for female brown bears varies somewhere between 19 and 33%, just depending on the female. And if a female enters her den with a body fat contact content below, uh, like about that 20% threshold, then reproduction doesn't really seem possible for brown bears. So that seems to be the lower threshold for her to support gestation and the birth of cubs. And single adult female bears experience a tremendous hunger like all bears, but that hunger really is, is driven unconsciously by more than just the female's individual survival. She's also eating for her family's needs. And um, that could be the, you know this summer if she has cubs right now or in, in the future if she is going to go into the den this year and perhaps give birth there. Chris, uh, the bear's mate mating season is, is almost over, although we're seeing a little bit of mating, act mating activity and courtship going on in the river here and there. So we're unlikely to see a lot of that going forward. And female bears, they, you know, the single ones, they may have conceived already, uh, you know, during the mating season, but uh, they're still going to utilize, I think, what is characterized as a what I like to think of it as a, a specialized physiological trick to delay the onset of pregnancy. That's true. That's so true, Mike. Um, as many of the viewers observed, uh, most commonly mating is occurring in late spring and right through midsummer. Um, even as recently as last week, we, we saw a 747 out at the falls. And considering that they're uh, conceived in the summer, it's... Um, they're also born in January or February, so it's just logical to assume that it's a very long gestation period, lasting from conception through birth in uh, January or February. However, uh, it's, they have what's called plantation. So these eggs are fertilized during mating, but they don't implant until later in the year, and most commonly when they actually enter the den in October and November. Even then, if, as you discussed, she hasn't had enough uh, fat reserves, implantation is not going to occur. However, if the cell is able to sustain a pregnancy, all the eggs implants will, sorry, all the eggs will implant at once, but not until 
um, she's actually entered the den. So can you tell what happens after implantation, Mike? That's actually, you know, I think, a really fascinating part of the biology of, of bears. Mother bears are challenged in a lot of different ways to raise cubs, and not the least of which is the energetic challenge of it all. Uh, rearing cubs takes a tremendous amount of energy. You're just, you know, I, I'm not a parent myself, but I was a child, and I do remember all of the trouble that I caused my parents when I was little, and they expended an incredible amount of energy to, to raise me. Uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Bear, bear moms are going through the exact the same thing in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, but the effort for mother bears is kind of complicated because of hibernation. Mother bears are the only animals that give birth and lactate while hibernating. And that's an amazing adaptation of physiology. Uh, during gestation, a mother bear must draw on her protein stores, which are limited in supply. Uh, because again, she only has so many uh, muscle reserves, only so much you know sugar in her body at that time. But, um, so, bo but body fat, in contrast, is readily available, and it's usually far more abundant than any than anything else. Uh, but body fat doesn't seem to really pass through the placenta for, as readily as protein and sugar. So, to or sort of overcome this challenge, uh, brown bear moms give birth to especially tiny babies. And this allows the mother bear to switch from placental nourishment, which really draws on her limited supply of body protein and sugar, to body fat, which mom has in abundance. So she's basically switching from those lean protein reserves to um, milk as a source of energy for her cubs. And, and for that reason, gestation of brown bears is really short. It only lasts about six to eight weeks, and cubs are born in midwinter, about the end of January or early February. So if you want to wish, your favorite bear a happy birthday put it on your calendar for about january 30 january 31st february 1 something like that and you can wish all of your favorite bears a happy birthday at that time uh, bear cubs they are purposely premature essentially at this stage they're about one pound in size uh, about eight to nine inches long uh, at birth and this is remarkably small among placental mammals bears give birth to the smallest babies in comparison to mothers body size. A black bear cub is only one one hundredth the, uh, the size of the smallest reproducing female black bears. And a newborn brown bear cub in Katmai is often one six hundredth the size of a large mother brown bear. So compare that to a human again. Uh, a 7.5 human uh, pound human newborn is one twentieth the size of a 150 pound mother. Uh, so they're blind, the cubs are blind, they're lightly furred, their ears are closed. About the only thing they can do is scream, eat, and relieve themselves. And so I, so I guess it's not that much unlike a, uh, a human newborn uh, at, at the time. And in the den, they're growing rapidly on mom's milk. They often weigh five pounds at one month, uh, about 15 to 20 pounds by the time they leave the den. They're, the mother's milk is extremely rich in fat, which the cubs can digest and, and utilize uh, very efficiently. So the weight gain for the cubs that first winter is entirely dependent on mom. It's a transfer of her body mass to the cubs via milk. And they do, the family doesn't have any other food sources at uh, that time. And in fact, I did see a question that, that came in. Uh, somebody was wondering, do cubs nurse through hibernation? And they will that, that very first winter after they're born. But once they're yearlings and uh, like two and a half year olds or older cubs, uh, they're all the cubs that we see on the river right now are going to uh, be surviving on the fat reserves that they gain during the summertime. So they're not going to be nursing um, this, this first full winter uh, for, for them. And mother bears with um, newborn cubs, they, they stay, also stay in the den longer than any other bears. In Katmai, they have uh, maybe started hibernation in November, but they won't emerge until May or in rare cases, even June. So that month after they come out of the den is a time really of extreme uh, vulnerability in, in the cubs. When the family leaves the den, the mother bear may, may not travel far. Um, the cubs are still developing their motor skills and their coordination. Uh, the terrain poses danger. Other bears pose danger. Uh, mother bears sometimes will sacrifice the opportunity to feed in areas with high calorie foods. Instead, they might avoid areas where bears gather to, to give their cubs an extra level of security. But we also know that mother bears uh, will 
with, with new, those newborn cubs especially are losing uh, maybe more protein stores in hibernation compared to other bears, especially like adult males. So uh, a mother bear may need to consume high protein foods in the springtime to help recoup those losses. Salmon are an important uh, part of that effort, uh, but for bears living outside of the Brooks River area, they often don't have access to salmon until midsummer. So they'll seek out other foods. And that can be newly emergent grass and sedge when it's young as, uh, and tender, as well as clams for some of the bears living on Katmai's Pacific coast. Bears are adaptable omnivores and they readily take advantage of any food to regain body mass that they sacrificed for their cubs. Much of what mother bears do, Chris, I think is a, is a balancing act. They're trying to balance risk versus reward, safety versus the satiation of hunger. And first year bear cubs can experience a pretty high mortality rate, uh, even though mother bears are very defensive and they do sacrifice a lot for their cubs. But, but Chris, that, that um, mortality rate can, can vary from place to place as I understand it. It, it, it really can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, cub mortality does vary quite a bit, um, but it is significantly high in that first year. A uh, study from the coast of Katmai from 1990s found it to be almost 65%. However, in other places in Alaska, it ranged anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. So this is dependent on a number of factors. Cub survival can depend on competition for resources, predation, infanticide, or even the age of their mothers. Younger sows not only have smaller litters, but experience higher cub mortality. We have seen with 909 with her cubs staying close to mom for protection, especially at the falls. This is because infanticide, when a bear kills a cub, may be committed by either sex but it is more commonly committed by male bears. While it is maybe hard to understand this for us humans, it is a natural part of the bear world. Mom is her cub's main protector, and we see this in the decision she makes, for instance, by choosing a patient with less competition. We've seen 402 in her cubs, as well as 94 in her, for staying downriver away from the dangers at the falls. Threat and competition exist from outside sources, but also from within litters. We've often seen rivalry among siblings develop during the cub's first year, and this starts as early as life in the den, when the litter mates may compete for the most productive teats when nursing. Larger litters sometimes experience higher mortality rates due to increased competition for resources with their own litter mates. This saga of competition extends well beyond their cub years and continues throughout their entire lives, but sibling rivalry within litters also helps prepare cubs for future success as they learn and grow. Mike, it sounds like the cubs face some difficult hurdles. What can you tell us about cubs and the importance of their food sources? Yeah, right now I, if we get to watch the, the cubs, first year cubs and older cubs, you know, experience an apprenticeship with mother. This is really a time of growth for them, new experiences and opportunities for them to uh, express and satisfy their curiosity. And I think those things sometimes make watching their family so enjoyable and so interesting. Uh, they show, the cubs in particular show an interest in nearly everything that mother does and everything that she investigates, especially when it has uh, something to do with food or it seems like she's sniffing it or she's putting it in her mouth. The cubs are immediately there. Uh, if they haven't seen her do that before or recognize that she has done that before, they want to know exactly what she is doing. Is this a good thing for me to eat? And uh, of course, you know, their hunger doesn't go away. If anything, in early summer, it increases. For the first few months after the family exits, exits the den, cubs remain reliant on mother's milk. Their digestive systems aren't yet mature enough to really survive on other foods. And the amount of milk that a cub demands in late spring is large. Um, for those spring cubs, especially yearlings and older cubs, like these yearlings here, they'll nurse but they're not completely dependent on mother's milk. They can survive on other foods quite easy, easily. But first year cubs in late spring and early summer, they need a lot of milk, maybe as much as 45 ounces of milk per day. So consider what that means for Bear 94 uh, that we saw in a few clips just a, a moment ago. The amount of milk that she needs to produce is just incredible. A gallon of milk is 128 fluid ounces. So if you go to the grocery store, you pick up a gallon of milk, that's how much um, you know is contained within it. So 94's cubs could drink more than a gallon of milk per day or about four liters of milk. This is 
the, like Chris was mentioning, probably the Cubs' first taste of competition. Milk isn't available in unlimited supplies. So it can be difficult for Cubs to satisfy that hunger. And they, they really do uh, go, go through a tremendous growth spurt at this time of the year. Uh, Chris, like you were mentioning, uh, that competition really never goes away. Cubs are going to experience that uh, competition in different ways throughout their, their whole lives. Although as Cubs grow and mature, they become less reliant on milk. And especially in their second and possibly uh, third summers with, with mom. So how does that time period maybe differ from what those first year Cubs are experiencing? The first year cubs, like you mentioned, are, are heavily dependent on their mother's milk. And let me tell you, when they're hungry, they're hungry. And you can hear them half halfway across uh, camp when they're yelling at mom to be fed. But um, like I said, as well, they get into the second year and third year, they're still dependent on their mom's milk for some nutrition and calories. But they're learning to find other sources for those calories. They are fishing some on their own. Not always successfully. It takes them some time. But they'll also learn to grab scraps and share fish with their uh, mom or their siblings. We also start to notice them consuming more grasses and berries when they're available, adding essential foods to their diet to supplement their mom's milk. Um, especially, uh, they learn to look to catch some more fish, and they do tend to t uh, come further down river and to catch some of the dead and dying fish as well. Um, but can you tell us what other skills they need to work on to make it through? It's, it's also fun to watch, yeah, the, the, the maturity level of cubs in each year change, you know, from how highly dependent they are uh, on mom when they first arrive as like a five-month-old to uh, how independent they are uh, by the end of like their second or third summer, or even their first summer. They do kind of show um, a great deal of maturity and, and independence. Um, of course, uh, you know, the, the difference in maturity that a spring cub experiences, that's really eclipsed by the independence and maturity gained by yearlings. And for me, that's one of the more interesting storylines to watch in brown bears. We can look at 909's yearling this year. Um, that bear's a bit clingy, sticks to mom's side, especially near the falls. It hasn't yet shown a lot of proficiency necessary to catch its own salmon. Uh, but by the end of the summer, we'll, we'll see it primarily catching its own fish. Uh, and you can watch for that transition in some of the other yearlings that we might see at the end of the summer as well, such as uh, 132s and number 482 Bretts. Um, both of those um, ba mother bears have two yearlings. And I think maybe the ultimate example of uh, uh, bear families uh, or the cubs within a bear family gaining independence very quickly, even though mother is a great provider, is Grazer and her yearlings. She has done such a tremendous job of giving her cubs the opportunity to fish at Brooks Falls, and they've developed some tremendously advanced fishing skills for bears of their of their age. Uh, so, Chris, the, you know the differences in maturity and independence is, is, I think, really clear between a cub's first summer and its second summer and its third summer. Of course, there's also a tremendous difference in size between uh, those age groups. There definitely is. Uh, we see them go from the first summer where they're just tiny, maybe 15 pounds and maybe end out the summer at 70, 80 pounds. Uh, they come back the following spring, anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds. And I have to tell you, they're going to double their weight over the, over the time. Um, probably, yes, they'll still need their mother's milk, but they're becoming much more skilled at fishing and uh, require the salmon to gain weight they need. And at this point, they are much more proficient at fishing. Um, and they'll get much more so as the summer progresses. If you've noticed uh, from the falls, you've seen how much larger 909 and 482's yearlings have grown just since they returned to the river this spring. Uh, they are they spend a lot of time at the falls with their moms, uh, 482 more, more commonly at the riffles, but they're definitely doing a lot better fishing uh, and they'll need that salmon to make it through the winter for themselves. So uh, what other advantages might be for a cup to stay with a mom for uh, maybe even an additional summer? That, you know, I think that's one of the, the maybe in a, in a way unanswered questions, uh, you know, regarding, regarding um, bears and, and especially brown bears too, because when you look at black bears, at least we compare black bears to brown bears. Black bears wean their cubs at the beginning of, the, of the, their cubs' second summer. So as a, a one and a half year old, 
And sometimes that happens in brown bears. In fact, it happens, I think, quite often in the bears in Scandinavia, for instance. But in Katmai, mother bears uh, will either keep their cubs through um, three summers or, yeah, or yeah, through like a, a second or third summer. Sometimes they separate at the beginning of the cub's third summer. Sometimes they separate at the beginning of a cub's third summer. They usually don't switch the length of maternal care. And that's why I expected Grazer this year to, to separate from her cubs in late spring. Uh, that's what she had done with her previous litter, but she didn't do that uh, this year with her current litter, which raises many questions. In fact, we had, a, um, you know, we had many questions come in this summer about that. Um, you know, one person asked, um, I think maybe just this past week, uh, were you surprised that Grazer kept her cubs an extra year when she didn't do that with her first litter? And I was surprised. I certainly expected her to wean this litter. Uh, so there's there's a lot of, I think, uncertainty, um, in, at least in our knowledge about, um, you know, this event, why a mother bear would, you know, quote unquote, choose to keep uh, cubs for that extra third summer when many um, cubs are weaned um, at that time. Family breakup in brown bears is triggered primarily by a couple of factors. One is the mother bear begins to enter her estrus cycle and that makes her receptive to mating. She can sometimes become intolerant of her cubs at that time. And then the second part of that is that adult males sense the opportunity to mate with the female. So this generally happens in May and June and a mother bear may not necessarily become intolerant of her cubs from what I've read when she enters estrus. Uh, sometimes the cubs try to stick around possible. I mean, that's beneficial to them, right? That, that seems, you know, uh, pretty, pretty obvious. Like the, the longer they can stay with mom, the more protection and lessons that she can provide. Uh, but older cubs, again, they're, they're becoming more independent. They're not uh, nutritionally dependent on mother's milk. What really might get the cubs attention in those situations is the presence of an adult male who seems particularly interested in the mother. And all of a sudden the cubs are like, you know, this maybe isn't a safe situation for me to hang around. So a lurking male can often serve as motivation to help the cubs disperse. Uh, it's, it's important to remember though, that the decision to separate from, you know, uh, from a, a, a mother's decision to separate from her cubs, that's not a conscious choice by the mother. It's dictated by hormonal changes. So a female bear can't really, in a sense, choose to keep her cubs and forego estrus any more than she can choose to, uh, to determine the duration of her pregnancy. It's just sort of like an automatic thing that happens. So we don't know why Grazer decided to keep her cubs that extra year. Um, it's, it's likely a trade-off. And I think that's one of the things that we can consider when we're thinking about that situation. If Grazer were to wean her cubs uh, sooner um, than when they're two and a half years old, like if she would have done that at the beginning of the summer, uh, then she could have more litters. And that could help boost her total lifetime reproductive output. But if she cares for them through this third summer, then perhaps she can give her litters a greater chance of surviving until adulthood. Uh, so those are, I think, you know, a couple of factors that mother bears are unconsciously weighing, either their bodies are doing it or, you know, something else is, is going on. Uh, but it's variable, um, you know, the age of separation with moms. And I think that means there's no one right way uh, to do it. Chris, can you think of any other, you know, advantages that there might be for a cub to stay with mother for three summers as opposed to two? I can. I mean, usually after a one summer is a yearling, then they'll den one more winter before being separated in the spring. But it seems like there's, we've had a few bears, 94, for example, or 128, who've kept them a little longer. So while the usual is 2.5 years here with mom, on occasion, they do keep them a little longer. And this can be advantageous for the cubs as they have an extra year of mom's protection, especially in the case of 128 Grazer, who's pretty uh, defensive for her cubs and takes pretty good care of them, um, and to teach them how to socialize, how to do better fishing, although how much they, you know, how much better fishing they can on, get on the lip, I don't know. They, they, they've done a really good job this year out there. Um, last year we saw 708, she held on hers uh, an, an extra year. So while it's standard for them to be kept for two and a half years, it's not abnormal. And I think it's really to their advantage to stay with mom, just that extra. Um, but just think about it. At the rate they're growing, how big are 128's cubs going to be by the end of the summer? Yeah, they're going to be giants. It's, it's going to be really fun to watch them. 
at the end of the year because I think all three of them will be balloons. Um, they'll be really healthy, really fat. I wonder if we entered all three of them together as a triple threat in Tip After Week if they could win as a family. Um, so I think we we'll need to, to enter them we'll as, a, to... as a family, right? <laughs> So yeah, that that'll be something that we'll we'll um, we'll have to think about more as we head closer towards the end of the year. So you know the stories of all of these these bear families are going to continue throughout the year, and that's going to be I think really fun for us to continue to watch the challenges um, that they that they go through, um, the devotion of mom, the heroics um, that you know, in in a way that that she um, performs to help raise them the instincts and skills necessary to overcome all of those challenges. I mean, it's clearly on display when we watch. Uh, bear families. And Chris, as we have been talking, giving people, I think, uh, what we've tried to be, you know, some of the basics about bear family, we've got a lot of questions um, that have come in. So um, you ready to hit it and, and uh, answer a few viewer questions or many viewer questions? I'm ready. All right. So we'll try to uh, get through as many of these as we can. We appreciate everyone's uh, questions who either submitted those in advance through the Ask Your Bear Camp question form or during the live chat. If you do want to submit any questions in advance for any of our live events, there's on explore.org below any of the Bear Camp pages in the partner tab on the left-hand side of the screen below the live camera feed, you can find a link to that form and you can submit questions there. We don't often get a chance to answer them all, but I do read them all and I appreciate everyone's time submitting um, those questions. Um, Chris, this is, I think, a question that we're going to have to maybe speculate on because I don't know the answer specifically for myself. Um, but somebody was wondering if it is possible for bears to recognize uh, the scent of, or other traits of a particular mo mother uh, from like a subadult after family breakup. So this person writes, for instance, would bears next year recognize and remember grazers girls um, and being able to see them as 128s. Personally, I, I think they would remember those bears, but maybe not say, oh, those are grazers. They might just be able to remember those bears' individual scent and maybe not the family lineage. But bears have an exceptional sense of smell. And what's going on, on in their brain with, with um, you know, interpreting odor is something that you know, we don't quite understand yet because it is so powerful. I agree. I think that this, their um, sense of smell is so... Um, so wonderful, uh, for lack of a better word, um, that they would associate it with those bears, um, but not so much as children as uh, maybe with the actions or where they saw them, maybe on the lip or just different actions that they observed in the season. If we often see, um, you know, especially first year cubs acting very skittish and timid around other bears. When we see, you know, mother taking them to the river, for instance, and they first, you know, see people for the first time, or they see other bears, it's it's unnerving for them. I think you can see that in, you know, in in the expressions of the cubs, or at least I'm, you know, when I'm trying to read their body language. Uh, so somebody was wondering, are cubs normally afraid of other bears, or is this behavior that's learned from mom? From from what I've from what I've seen, it seems to be instinctual in them, just because they seem to react that way when they first show up at the river. I think they're watching mom as well. Uh, if mom's cautious, I think they're going to take the cues from her. So I think they learn that and which bears mom's wary of and, and just follow her lead. That is very true. Uh, if mother is relaxed, the cubs are going to be relaxed. If mother is stressed out, the cubs are going to be stressed out. So we can see that fairly clearly through the webcams. Um, and if you're at the river, then that also it's it's like right in your face there. You know, you can sometimes see um, or and hear mother huffing. You can see her jaw popping. And when those things are happening, the cubs are really um, stressed out in those moments. But if she's kind of relaxed and sleeping, um, and especially if the cubs have a good belly full of milk, then then um, yeah, then, then the cubs are often very relaxed in those situations. Question, you know, that we didn't uh, cover in this live chat, um, but it is about mating and, and it does have to do often with bear families, but somebody was wondering, is it possible for a female bear or, or a sow, uh, as they're otherwise known, to have a litter with more than one sire? So more than one male bear. What do we know about that? It is possible. Uh, unlikely, but it does happen. They mate with multiple males um, and it is, uh, ovulation is, by simulation, so they will uh, conceive something every time. Whether it gets implanted or not, we don't know. 
uh, it does happen, but I don't think is all that common. Yeah, the limited DNA evidence that we have from Brooks River doesn't uh, or didn't find evidence of multiple fathers for a single litter. So it can happen for sure, but um, we haven't found it at, at Brooks River. Uh, I, I don't doubt that it has happened somewhere at some point in time, but we just don't have the evidence for it right now um, at, at Brooks River itself. Uh, there was actually um, a, a paper when I was brushing up on, you know, my facts for this live chat, Chris, I was, I, I read an abstract for a paper and I can't remember its title, unfortunately, but it was about um, uh, something about um, different birth dates for bears within the same litter. So it came from a captive facility, I think Washington State University, and they ended up finding that or, or observing since they had captive bears there that um, there was a litter of three that was born, but there was two cubs that were born um, at the same time. And then it was like something like a week or two later that a, a, a third cub was born. And the researchers did some DNA um, analysis on those um, cubs and they found they all had the same father. So maybe they just had different like impl implantation times or something else was going on weirdly with, with that litter. Um, but I also wonder sometimes if that can account for, uh, if, if that happens, more frequently than we know. I wonder if that can account for sometimes the um, the runts of the litter that we sometimes see, because especially with like large litter, you often have a very small bear that's accompanying accompanied by you know some larger litter mates. Or even in a five out four case where one of her yearlings is clearly larger than the other and a completely different color, you have to wonder about that. It's possible, but uh, I guess we'll never know. And you know, we talked. We've we focused. Uh, during this live chat, Chris, entirely on mothers and their cubs. But somebody is wondering, are there instances of male bears being involved in raising cubs? So what is the male's role in this process? Uh, the male pretty much um, mates with the female and then that he's pretty much done. That's the last input he has uh, until the following year. So um, he has no input at all. Well, I can't say no input. I should say he does not help raise the cubs at all. Yeah, he has a role to play, but it's not in raising offspring. So once copulation happens, um, you know, he's he's um, moving on to um, to other other things. And uh, and but we also didn't mention this either. But what at what age do females begin having um, litters and what age do they become sexually mature? I think it's anywhere between five and seven, I believe. Um, 909 oh, nine and 910 are, I believe, only about five. And they both had one, so uh, I could be wrong, but it's around five to seven. Yeah, that's generally what I have uh, observed with the brown bears at Brooks River, and also that that matches the literature that you can read about brown bears. So right around the, the a bear's fifth year of life, it seems to um, you know become sexually mature. There's variation in there because there's no set age uh, when a bear becomes sexually mature. Just like in people, I mean, there's a lot of variation in in humans as well. Uh, there, one of the interesting things that I uh, have read about too, Chris, is that sometimes there can be like a delay in the age that a female will actually give birth. So she might, you know, become sexually mature around age five, but she might not give birth until like her seventh year or eighth year or ninth year sometimes. Um, and there's some evidence, and uh, and I think this is something that I, I wish like biologists would try to investigate more. There's some evidence that like in areas with like, uh, I guess a really high, you know, density of bears, especially if uh, a mother bear overlaps her home range with her female daughters, then, um, then sometimes that there's like a social repression of, you know, uh, of, of the daughter's ability to give birth. Um, that I think that's maybe not the best way to explain it, but that's one of the things that, um, that has been observed at least in black bears. And I, in high, where, where there's a really high density of brown bears, um, like we have in Katmai National Park, I really wouldn't doubt it. It happens here too. But we see a lot of young bears at the river, uh, you know, giving birth and, and raising cubs. Um, because let, let's see, um, nine, 909 and 910, can you remember off the top of your head what year I think they were born? Maybe it was a 20, I think it was 2016. Um, I think so they're it was not very 2016. Old. No. Yeah, and they, and, they have, and they have cubs right now, but at, at different ages. But I also read that uh, the younger the mother, the less likely the cub is to survive. So if in the cases where they 
maybe mature at five. They don't give birth till seven because their body is not able to. It's not um, able to s sustain a pregnancy. Um, I read a paper on that that was uh, theorizing that it could be the size of the mother or the lack of size or condition of the body that makes it less likely for them to give birth to a cub at five. And when you also, one other interesting part of this is when you look at um, the growth rate of female bears, I mean, it it tracks along with adult males, um, you know, through the subadult years, although males kind of grow at maybe sometimes a slightly greater rate. But um, once they reach uh, the age of reproductive maturity, then it really starts to plateau for mother bears. Although in a food rich area like Katmai, continued, uh, can, they, their body size continues to go up and even into their teen years, even after they've had litters of cubs. While male bears, they just it just continues to go up and up and up really into the middle teenage, uh, teen years for them. So when, if a bear is like 15, for example, um, that's when a, an adult male might reach its maximum body size. But the, the growth rate of, of female bears really plateaus because they're just devoting so much energy to their offspring. Um, and it, that probably has a factor in the age at first reproduction as well. Uh, what about, Chris, um, how many years a female bear will continue to have cubs? Somebody was wondering about that. For example, how many litters of cubs has 128 grazer had? So maybe we can, you know, if you want to maybe refresh our memories on her life history a little bit and, um, you know, her roundabout age. Um, and then we can maybe speculate on the maximum age of um, uh, a bear's ability to, to give birth. I believe they can uh, continue to give birth into their 20s. And I think that's about where 128 Grazer is now in her early 20s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so if you say that she gave birth at the first time about six or seven, um, she usually keeps them only three years. Not she'll, she'll keep an extra. So I don't know. What is that about? Five litters maybe? I think with Grazer, she's had um, just two, if I remember correctly. Um, but she, she's, um, you know, not, I guess, one of the females that I would say has had a lot of, lot of cubs so far. She could have many more cubs as she, as she continues um, to mature. Uh, we saw 402 just briefly this year. And I think with her, I, like her, the litter that she brought back this year might be like her eighth or her ninth litter. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's one of those, uh, which is really kind of remarkable um, that she can have that many litters. And she's in her mid twenties. The one reason why 402 only has, um, or has had so many litters is because when, in her younger years, um, she ended up um, losing cubs early in the season. She went back into estrus, she made it immediately. And then she came back the next year with another litter. So she wasn't able to wean all of her cubs successfully, but they can have a lot of litters given the, you know, the right circumstances. And there's definitely evidence that they have um, cubs into um, their, their late twenties. Sometimes people wonder uh, if bears will uh, have their experience, their own form of menopause or they'll become senescent. And there does seem to be some evidence of that in brown bears, but I think most female bears just grow, don't grow old enough. For that if it happens it probably doesn't happen until their very late 20s or or their early 30s so um you know maybe we can uh, try to tease more of that information out um at, by watching the cameras if we get do get the opportunity to see some very old uh, female bears in the future that had been um you know fairly fecund in their their younger years if you're hearing a lot of background noise uh with uh that's uh, that's coming from Chris's location. Oftentimes, people are like, "Oh, you know, the the river, you know, at Brooks River, it must be so quiet and peaceful there." But during the middle of the day, uh, Chris, it gets uh, quite quite noisy with all the airplanes coming in. It, it's really like a like an airport there. We've had uh, quite a few planes today. All seem to be taking off at the same time, so that is this. Hey, Chris, can you talk again about? Um, brown bear milk and how long um, a mother bear produces milk for her cubs. We touched on that, um, you know, during the main part of our broadcast, but somebody did ask, how long does a brown bear produce milk for their cubs? As long as her uh, cubs decide to suckle, I think. I've been nursing hers uh, earlier this summer. So that's at least three seasons. 
And yeah, one of the one of the really amazing things about that process is that moms stop lactating when they hibernate with their older cubs. So like like Grazer, for instance, she's not going to be nursing her cubs in the den this winter. So she stops lactating. They somehow have the ability to switch that on and off during hibernation. And that also seems to be uh, an unstudied aspect of, of bear physiology. I have not read any scientific papers that are uh, that look at that process um, specifically. So I think that is really an amazing ability because that's something that 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 um, that women don't don't have. You know, you can't just like switch it off for several months and, and turn it and turn it back on. But but brown bear moms, they can do that. So a mother bear going into the den yes, this year with first year cubs, she won't be nursing them in the den. But when she comes out and those cubs have uh, you know become yearlings or a year and a half old, she'll be able to um, to nurse them on her milk once again. And somebody was wondering about the fat content in brown bear's milk. Um, real quick, that can vary depending on the time of the year. Uh, when the cubs are first born, it's it's actually fattier, um, maybe like upwards of 30% milk, uh, fat. But um, it, it, de it declines in overall fat content as those, as those cubs mature. So right around this time of the year, it might be more or less uh, around 20% or so, if I remember my uh, facts correctly. That sounds, that and sounds about right. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm glad you could <laughs> confirm that. We we throw out so many different uh, statistics, you know, during these conversations that sometimes it, we're bound to get them get them screwed up. And sometimes I'm like, well, where did I get that statistic? So uh, today, in fact, I spent probably like an hour trying to find <laughs> one of the specific um, the st stats that I that I threw out during during the conversation, just so I I knew what um, I remembered what I was talking about correctly. Uh, and Chris, are you aware, uh, this is an interesting question, are you aware of any instances where mother bears have rejected cubs and refused to nurse them? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I've been out here, I haven't seen that happen. But we may not know about it either. If they rejected them, they may not even make it as far as the falls or to the river in the spring if they've rejected them. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. And I think, you know, if it, if it happened, for some reason, especially if that cub is very young, then it wouldn't be able to make the journey following mom uh, to to the river at at that time. Um, one of the things I guess that we can before we conclude our broadcast here, we do have a ton of questions um, still to answer. But there was one event, Chris, I think that was fairly interesting to watch um, that we captured on the Brooks Falls camp earlier today, and this might be a good opportunity to talk about that. There's, that was um, an instance where nine ten was up on the lip of Brooks Falls and her cub fell off here. So this is a replay of that. Now I'm gonna to say to everybody, the cub is okay. So, um, you know, no, no freaking out about that. The cub is fine, but the cub slips over the falls. It was out there. This is a first year cub. So it, I think it underscores sometimes just how difficult it is for the cubs to navigate the water. The mother on the lip of the falls, not really sure what to do immediately. Another bear shows curiosity towards that cub, but all of a sudden it's just like, you know what? Uh, it's uh, that's a cub. That's not a salmon. <laughs> and also, the mother comes down and retrieves it um, immediately uh, afterwards. So moms are very attentive, you know, to their cubs. They can recognize when their cubs are in danger. I think it took uh, number nine ten a few seconds to realize, hey, the cub can't climb back over the falls, and I better find it um, down below. But I also found the the behavior of that male bear in the jacuzzi to be interesting because it, it was certainly curious about that cub, but it didn't really show any aggression towards it. No, it did not. It really couldn't have cared less. I don't think that it came over as long as it wasn't going after a salmon. And that's, you know, sometimes people will, um, you know, we, we mentioned it uh, during our broadcast, how infanticide is a danger for bear cubs. And that's one reason why mother bears are so ornery and defensive to give their cubs, you know, the protection they need to survive. But not all male bears look at a cub and say, you know what, that's an opportunity for me to, to go kill it. Um, so again, this is I think that I think that is a really clear and a really good instance of how a male bear and that was a young adult male. I'm not sure of its identity, but you know, kind of just looking over at the cub and saying, uh, whatever that that cub is doing, it can just go ahead and do its thing. I don't need to um, to bother bother it at, at, at all. What about the after the separation process happens, Chris? Um, somebody was wondering, do mother bears recognize their cubs after separation uh, at at any time. So what have you observed with that with that process? And what do we know about mother bears recognizing their, re recognizing their cubs 
after the families. I think they do. I think they do recognize them, but they just reinforce the separation. I think that I've seen them run them off. Um, once they're once they've separated, I think that moms are done. They recognize them, but they're just not interested in uh, nurturing them anymore. Yeah, that's what I have observed as well. Especially when, like, if if a young independent subadult bear encounters its mother, um, the mother bear might kind of rush at it a little bit, a little bit of a bluff charge, just to kind of reinforce that family separation. I saw Holly do that actually with Backpack um, when he was like a two and a half year old or three and a half year old or something like that. And I've seen other mother bears do that on occasion. So there, there's no really like happy family reunion in those situations. Most of the time, um, at best, mom will greet their, their, um, their former cubs uh, with indifference more than anything else and then in adulthood we've seen them at the at the river together um in fact maybe last week there was a, a, a i remember watching the brooks falls camera and seeing bear 435 holly at the falls um and her grown her now very large adult male son number 89 backpack fishing behind her and they really didn't interact at all they just seemed to ignore one one another so i'm sure they recognize each other but most of the time um it's it's met by indifference or um or they just ignore each other especially into uh, adulthood chris uh, can you maybe talk a little bit more about the size difference between um between siblings we talked about um you know sibling rivalry a little bit cubs aren't necessarily super aggressive towards each other like you can sometimes see in a bird nest for instance like if you watch a heron a blue heron nest i mean the, sometimes um the herons will kill their siblings if they're especially if there's a shortage of food so we don't see that in brown bear cubs but there's definitely a rivalry so somebody was wondering why is there a size difference between siblings so what do we know about sibling rivalry and how that might influence it they they're pretty competitive as far as the mom's teats are and uh, from what i've read that some are more productive than others so if the one bear knows which one is the most productive and gets that one every time chances are he's going to gain a little more weight I would think sometimes they're better, better at fishing or at grabbing the scraps or even getting the fish away from mom. I think it's behavior, behaviors they've learned that they're now using um, to feed themselves and give themselves more calories than over the other bear. Especially, I think it wouldn't be surprising to see 94s have one that's, um, I guess for lack of a better word, runt. Um, maybe a little smaller than the others is not getting as much milk or as much food as the rest. Yeah, I also wonder if, um, you know, genetics plays a role in that as well. Like in people, you know, some people just grow faster than others. And I wonder if that happens with bear cubs too. But that competition for food, especially, you know, in large litters, definitely plays a role. So I think with, you know, when you do see runts of a litter, for instance, then, yeah, I think food competition definitely plays a big, big role in that. We did have a, a question come in from somebody who is 10 years old. So thanks for submitting that question. We love to hear um, from kids and we hope that, you know, everyone who is watching, you know, if you're young and you're interested in bears, we hope that, you know, some of these unanswered questions about brown bears, um, you know, maybe you'll have the chance to study them and find those answers uh, in the future. So somebody who was 10 years old was wondering, do you think that 94 will separate from her cubs at different times? And I, I think, Chris, that that separation process is probably going to happen all at once, not not at the end of, not, not next summer, maybe the summer after that, or maybe the summer after that. So uh, 94 is one of those bears that has switched the amount of time that she's cared for her cubs. But it seems like that separation process for all four of those cubs, if she weans them and is successful doing that, probably will happen all, all at once. I agree. I think that when she decides it's time, she'll separate from all four at the same time. And it's going to be really challenging for 94 to successfully raise all of those cubs. Um, somebody, you know, or we've actually gotten many questions so far this summer about um, whether she can do that or has it ever been, has it ever happened at Brooks River before? Uh, there's a, a, a famous bear in the Tetons uh, of Wyoming in Grand Teton National Park and the surrounding region in the Jackson Hole area, number 399, who seemed like she successfully weaned a, a litter of four cubs. And that's an, an amazing feat for a grizzly bear in that ecosystem because uh, unlike bears in Katmai, they don't have access to salmon. You know, they have to rely on 
dispersed, um, you know, food resources, a lot more vegetation in their diet than the bears in Katmai. So that was really an, an amazing feat. Uh, we actually have never seen that happen with um, a mother bear at, at Brooks River. So hopefully 94 can do it. It'll be a real challenge for her, but no mother who's ever returned to Brooks River with four cubs has successfully weaned them. So I think everyone's cheering for 94's cubs, but, um, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be a real challenge. She's and Chris, done three um, before, somebody is, so. <laughs> yeah, she's done, she's done three before. So, you know, she's got the maternal experience. I think that's a, that's a really great point. And I want to throw this question, this next question to you first, because it's, um, it's asking about park rangers in a sense, or asking park rangers. Um, are, somebody's wondering, are park rangers able to tell what sex the, the COIs are? And COI stands for Cub of the Year. So if you ever see that acronym, that's what that stands for. Are, are park rangers able to tell what sex COIs are, or does it take several years to tell? It takes several years. Um, I, I personally am unable to tell uh, up until probably they're sub-adults, but uh, I think I think it's a while before you can really determine sex on on the uh, cubs. Yeah, you're not going to be able to see the important parts that can tell, um, you know, a boy bear from a girl bear. The one thing that you can watch for, and this is sometimes even hard to see in cubs, is the um, the direction that they pee. Female uh, bears will pee out behind them, and male bears will pee straight down between their hind legs. So if you're getting a really good view of a bear cub and it's peeing, then you can tell. But otherwise, um, it's going to be uh, pretty difficult. We'll try to get to um, just a couple more questions here before we conclude our broadcast today. Thanks to everybody who has submitted questions for our, our live chat on mother brown bears and cubs in the, in the family life of brown bears. Is there uh, one question that one of the latter questions that came in, somebody was wondering, is there a history of mothers keeping their cubs for a fourth summer? And I can say yes. Just once I have seen this at Brooks River, and that was with um, number 438. Uh, she was nicknamed Flo. She had really long white claws, pretty distinctive um, mother bear. In the last litter that she returned with at Brooks River, she kept them for four summers. We don't know why, uh, but they were just giants. It was like this pack of bears running around there, around the river. She had so she had two um, <laughs> two giant cubs in their um, in their fourth summer with her. So it does it has happened once, um, but that's the only instance. So. Um, it, that would, it's an extremely rare case. Um, I, most of the time they separate um, before that. And um, Chris, uh, uh, maybe one final question here that we'll, we'll answer. I don't know if you have any extra news, but we, uh, there was uh, a cub that uh, was found dead along the river. You don't um, really know the circumstances that led to that cub's death. Um, I think it was uh, last week. Uh, but somebody was wondering if there's any news about that cub because it was collected for necropsy and shipped off um, to the state wildlife veterinarian, I believe, um, for a necropsy. But do you have any updates on that situation? We do not. We do not have any updates on the status of that bear cub. Um, as soon as we hear something, we'll be uh, short of passing the time for us to ship it out and get the result out. And yeah, I did. Uh, hear from one of your colleagues that there was a shipping delay so they had to um you know uh, put the put the cub in the freezer um for a period of time um just because it, it's it's you know when you're when you're living in remote alaska like chris is right now it's not very easy to get things in and out so especially at this time of the year when um basically all the cargo planes are full of salmon and they're full of employees who are working in the fishing industry and they're full of all of the equipment that's getting sent out from the fishing industry and everything um like like that so i'm sure you know chris and her colleagues will be sure to update us as soon as they find any um any information chris this has been a, um, a really fun chat uh you know do you have any final thoughts about um, mother bears and cubs that you want to share with us any stories that you think people should follow or any uh, you know any any final themes for uh for the for the day yeah, I'm just enjoying seeing all the moms and cubs here this year, uh, especially the spring cubs with 94. Uh, she seems to have uh, made herself a little absent right now. I we hear she may be over at Margo Creek. But for the most part, we're just enjoying seeing especially 910 with her cub at the falls. She trees him, but he's getting quite plump. Um, I think he's a good contender uh, comes, comes the fall. Uh, it's just it's a really fun time to be here. 
watching all the Cubs grow up. And it's continue. It's going to continue to be a really fun time as well as we see the, a lot of those bears return in the fall. Uh, if you th- if you think the Cubs are cute now, where do you see see them as just big balls? So I think that's something that we can look forward to later in the year. Chris, thanks so much for um, you know for uh, jumping on Explore.org today and and talking about the life of of mothers and cubs. It's my it's been my pleasure. Look forward to doing it again. So that's Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath at Katmai National Park, and my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for joining us today, and enjoy the stories of those mothers and cubs that you can watch every day on the Bear Camps. Have a great day, everybody.